How's it going, people? Well, I'm doing great. I woke up a little late, but I'm on I'm on vacation for the next two weeks. I'm spinning it up here on Mount Hope without TV, without internet. <laughs> I've already got two videos in the can, so well, you guys will see them after my vacation. I was going to read uh, another chapter last night, and I decided I'd do it in bed. I had everything set up. I laid down on the bed, and I was going to read it. I had all the lights on, and next thing I know, I'm waking up, and it's the afternoon. Yeah. And the book was in bed with me. Didn't suffer too much damage. It's, it's seen better days. A little early to be drinking, but you know, this goes good with coffee, single malt, and I'm having an espresso, so I didn't fill the cup up all the way. That's it. Uh, this will get the blood flowing. This is one of those warm drinks. Doesn't taste good over ice. Doesn't taste good mixed. It tastes good neat and at least room temperature. And it tastes awesome in coffee. <sighs> Chapter three. Flotsam. So let's see, it was uh, taken in the flood, the courier, Flotsam. Okay, I guess we're back on that flood theme. Nobody's shopping. They're doing that small print thing, but I haven't got my magnifier here. <clears throat> Only nine hours! Tom Hammond laughed musically at his own murmured thought. It seemed ridiculous almost to try to believe that only nine hours before he had been a discharged journalist. Well, now he was at the head of what he knew would be the greatest journalistic venture London, yay, the world had ever seen. I'm just hoping something happens finally, because we're three chapters in. And... Serendipitous, uh, most coincidental meeting on a busy shopping day on the streets. Piccadilly Square, I it was. Uh, a cab ride, some chin wagging, home, more people met, talk of a newspaper. It's, it's all exposition so far. All right. He had just dined. He felt that he wanted some kind of movement, some distraction. To relieve the tension, he was in that frame of mind, being a coming man, as they established in the last chapter, or the one before that. <laughs> Not much has happened. They all kind of blend together in my mind. He was in a frame of mind when some kind of adventure was necessary, although he did not tell himself this, being hardly conscious of his own need. He knew that the haunts of his fellows, club, theater, music hall, 
would always serve to irritate him, like those trappy flower girls with their lame-ass forced rhyme. <sighs> Some instinct turned his feet riverward. Sorry, that's forestry land back there, and somebody's enjoying their their dirt bike. It's cool. It's still quieter than than Carmichael. It was now a quarter past seven o'clock. Night had fallen upon London. Tom Hammond crossed the great commercial, great great Holborn thoroughfare. The heavier traffic of London's commercial life had almost ceased. That's the Industrial Revolution for you. The omnibuses were uh, the omnibuses going west were filled with theater goers and other pleasure seekers. Hansoms. Fitted, uh, flitted swiftly either way, each holding a man and a woman in evening dress. Probably head for the theater. One of them pleasure palaces. <clears throat> Having crossed the roadway, he paused for a moment. Don't do that. It's already slow enough. At the corner of uh, Chancery Lane, and let his eye take in all the scene. And again, Lee uh, Gallien came to his mind and he softly murmured, Ah, oh, London, London, our delight. Great flower that opens, but at night. Great city, of the mightiest, wait, great city of the midnight sun. <sighs> Whose day begins when night is done? Now that's a lot better than that flower girl, or, you know, chapter one. Uh, lamp after lamp against the sky opens a sudden beaming eye. Leaping a light on every hand, the iron lilies of the strand. That says lamps, they're iron lilies. Like dragonflies, the handsome hovers with jeweled eyes to catch the lovers. The streets are full of lights and loves. Swift gowns and flutter of soiled doves. Hey, there's nothing wrong with soiled doves. Some of my favorite people are soiled doves. Are you calling them tramps? Is that it, Mr. Christian guy? Uh, anyway, that's it for a second. And we're back into normal font. He turned with a faint sigh and began to pass on down uh, Chancery Lane. Oh, London, he mused. Thy surface may be wonderful and beautiful, but below, what are you below the surface? And then we're back into tiny font and quotation, so I guess he's gonna finish that, that little ditty. The human moths about the light Dash and cling in dazed delight, and burn and laugh the world and wife. The world has a wife. It's probably Venus. I don't know. For the for this is London. This is life. Upon thy petals, butterflies, but are thy root, 
but at thy root some say are lies. A world of weeping trotting things, trodden things, poor worms that have not eyes nor wings. And quote. Back to the narrative. He moved onwards in the direction of the law courts. Presently, he neared the Waterloo Bridge approach. He had all unrealized by himself oh. since he had left the restaurant where he had dined, been walking towards the river. Yeah, unconsciously his feet were directed that way. Probably a uh, divine inspiration. A moment or two after, and he was leaning on the parapet of the bridge, looking down into the dark waters. Sluggish, oil-like in appearance, as seen in the sudden longing, as seen in the dull gleam of the lamps. I keep reading it, so. Uh, really tight, small print. Things I do for my peeps. Uh, dull gleam of the lamps, the river moved seaward, a sudden longing to get out upon those dark waters came to him. He's kind of impulsive in his own deliberate, <laughs> slow-going way. <clears throat> Feel the circulation going. All right. If only he mused. Then, turning briskly, he came face to face with a man in a blue uh, Guernsey who was crossing the bridge. All these lucky happenstances. It was the very man of his half uttered thought. If only I could run up against Bob Carter. He had almost said, but we had to hear it anyway, even though he only almost said it. Good evening, Mr. Hammond. Kind of like they, he's a brief, it, it's slang. He's mispronouncing. So we had to hide it. The man in the gurney saluted with a thick tar stained forefinger as he recognized Tom Hank, Tom Hammond, not some other Tom. I mean he's the only Tom, but we still gotta distinguish him with his surname. You know, we, don't, we want to avoid confusion. Good evening, Carter, Hammond laughed as he added, I was just wishing I could meet you. Let's head for the river. That's where you meet folks. A lot of, uh, you know, flood of shoppers and then riverward. See, we're on this flood theme. We're dealing with flotsam right now. That's chapter three, flotsam. I felt I should like to get out on the river. I'm just going as fur as lamp bells, sir. If your likes, ter, go with with me, with with me. Uh, you'll do me proud, sir. You know that. I knows. Carter's a London hillbilly. He's hooked on Ebonics. Just kidding. All right. I really went there, didn't I? All right. A 
A few minutes later, the two minute, the two men, a few minutes later, the two men sat in Carter's boat. He just moves things right along. Hammond, in the stern, was steering sternly to starboard. The man, Carter, on the first thwart, manipulated the oars. Hammond had known the man about a year. And we've known him like half a dozen paragraphs. Uh, feels like a year, though. He had done him a kindness that the waterman had never forgotten. Lots of backstory here. Let's just not ever get to it, okay? Out, uh, out go to your world's end for ya, sir. For your sir. He had often said since, but tonight he gets to repay the favor by doing the rowing. Stroke. Stroke. The man was ordinarily a silent companion, and tonight, after a few exchange words between the pair, he was as silent as usual. Good, because his dialogue sucks. Down the wide, turgid river, the boat, propelled by Carter's two oars, shot jerkily. The rise and fall of the glow by the rower's pipe bowl. He's token. Synchronized with the lift and dip of the oars. Trippy. Hammond enjoyed the silence. There was a weirdness about the night trip on the river that fitted in with his mood. His brain had been considerably overwrought that day. The quiet row was beginning to soothe the overwrought nerves. I know how you feel. <sighs> Third bike seemed to have moved on. That's good. Like I said, just a little bit of noise is nothing. You know, chainsaw once in a while, a little hammering. <sighs> no car alarms going off. No sirens. <sighs> Sorry, back to right. Hammond enjoyed the silence all the bit. There was a weirdness about this night trip on the river that fitted in with his mood. His brain had been considerably overwrought that day. But quiet now was beginning to soothe the overwrought nerves, I think I'm caught up. Where he sat in the stern of the boat, he faced the clock tower at Westminster. The gleaming windows of the great embankment hotels lay behind him. A myriad electric lights were on his right hand. Figuratively speaking. Uh, the gloom and darkness of the unlighted uh, wharfage, wharfage on the Surrey side were on his left. Only by a waterway miracle, Carter cleared an anchored barge that, defying the laws of the river, carried no warning light. Good thing Carter's on the ball. He just can't speak with shit. A very hard guy to understand, even worse than me. Alright. Drat him! Growled the man Carter. Shut the fuck up, Carter. You were doing fine. Uh, they are to do a stretch in Portland or Dartmoor for breaking the lore. There's many an onst 
watermen whose boats found bottom up or smashed to smithereens and whose bodies found found or isn't just as the case may be all because they too lazy Huns to uh, how, how hounds is too idle bound to light a lamp cuss them cuss them yeah, finish the word skip the first part cuss them all right please shut up Carter. you're just you know you're just an extra you've had enough dialogue enough face time to smoke your pipe and row the damn boat His growl died away in his throat. The glowing fire of his pipe rose and fell quicker than ever, telling of a fierce anger burning within him. I understand. You know, he needs a, that barge needs a fix-it ticket. Shh, he hissed. Hammond saw that his face was turned shorewards. He heaved aft towards Hammond and whispered, Can you see that woman, sir? He jerked his chin in the direction of a line of moored barges. It's better to point. I mean, jerking your chin, that's just so Victorian. <clears throat> Hammond had turned his head and could only wait and could plainly discern the form of a woman standing on the edge of the outer barge of the cluster. Flip her off, she should have lit in a fucking warning lamp. Uh, maybe not. You know, I, I need a little uh, energy. Found these at the world market. They're from Australia, and they're terribly addictive. So don't start. It's already too late for me, but don't start. Uh. Mm. I'm just building suspense here. What about the lady? The woman? All right. man, the men in the boat still but watch them. Do she mean sore inside, sir? Sewer? Does she mean sewer side, sir? S-O-O-E-R S-I-D Sewer side. That's when you kill yourself by jumping through a man. With weights on your feet and pocket full of rocks and all that. Suicide. Alright, back to this. I'm really fucking all these videos up. I'm really, I'm really sorry. Whispered Carter, like I didn't know that was him. He almost don't need speech attribution. There, it's only two guys. And they speak speak distinctively different. Uh, this guy needed a he needed a uh, ghostwriter to fix his book. Then again, nothing's happened yet, hardly. Well, maybe something seems to be about to happen, like suicide or something. Looks like it, sir. Don't make a sound. Even as he spoke, the woman leaped. Into the air. Well, that sucks because she was aiming at the river. <laughs> Sorry. These things are intoxicating.
There was a low scream, a splash. A leap of foam flashed dully for one instant, then all was still again. We're just glad something finally fucking happened. And it's page 29 already. The waterman, the waterman, uh, piled his oars furiously. Hammond stirred for the spot where that foam had splashed. An instant later, the boat was over the place where the body had disappeared. I mean, she jumped into the sky and still managed to hit the river. That's good. Mission almost accomplished. Carter lay on the oars and peered into the darkness on one side. Hammond strained his eyes on the other side. This is great writing. You totally see that part. With startling suddenness, a hand darted upwards within a foot of where Hammond sat on, in the stern of the boat. God, all these lucky coincidences. In the same instant, the woman's head appeared. Hammond reached out excitedly. She's hot. <laughs> and she's wet. Even better. I apologize for that. Fucking candy. And caught the, the back hair of the woman. What he's going to use to steer with? He said his new rudder. It's trying to follow us. He caught the back of the hair of the woman, twisting his fingers securely into the knot of hair at the back of her head. That was all one sentence. Carter shipped his oars, and in two minutes, the wretched woman was safe in the boat, probably a soiled dove. Her drenched face gleamed white where they had laid her. They laid her on her face. A few whimpering sobs broke from her. Just a few. Turn her over. <laughs> ah, espresso. Espresso and single malt. Breakfast of Champions. <sighs> turn, turn her over on her face a little, sir, while I makes the boat fast for a minute or two, sir. You'd be safe. jerked out the waterman. He jerked that out. He didn't just say it. He jerked it out. Yeah, it's an exciting moment. Uh, poor soul over it. He went on nodding his nodding his painter to the bolt in the stern of, the, of a barge. She Ave took in a bellyful of Thames water, and it ain't uh, Thames. Excuse me, Thames, not Thames. Hey, I'm a Yankee man. Give me a break. But hey, chime in, educate me. You know, I'm a provincial Northern California Yankee. So probably not doing this right, and I'm a heathen. And circumstance, but for good reason. <sighs> and it ain't filtered no sort 
at Sarton. All right. Hammond had by this time turned the woman over on her face. I mean, really, Carter runs on for such a silent guy. Carter came aft bearing a water beaker in his hands. I'll lift her legs, sir, he said, and put this beaker under under her just above her knees. That'll help her a bit. That was done, and almost instantly the woman was very sick. <coughs> in my locker, in my locker there, sir, I've got a drop of whiskey. After reading that, after reading the temperance lady's letter, still insist on forcing libations on trap accident suicide women. At least it isn't brandy this time, it's whiskey. You rascals. Sidney Watson. He's the Bill Cosby of his times. I keeps it there for emergencies like this, said Carter. Right. This is just for emergencies, too. I just happen to have an emergency about it. Uh, having another emergency, hang on. Sorry, this book is just so fucking fascinating. I, I can't seem to take my eyes off of it. So much is happening. Finally. Hammond moved to allow the man to reach a seat locker in the stern. The next minute, while Hammond supported the woman, the waterman poured a few drops on a sp of the spirit down her throat. Expect another lady, a lady temperance letter, Sydney. You, you fucking rebel, you. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, yeah. She coughed and sputtered, but the draught restored her. She began to cry in a low, whimpering way. We must get her ashore, Carter, cried Hammond. I'll take the oars, and as you know the riverside better than I do, just steer into the nearest landing place you know. Carter leaped to the bows, cast off the painter, and hurried aft again. Such action. Just long year, sir. There's an old landin, as'll just serve us. What's your fink ter do with the poor soul, sir? And, uh, not, and her over to the perlis. Yeah, Carter would probably be worried about the cops. I mean, why is he going out at night in a boat? Just wondering. All right. No, neither the police nor workhouse carter i wish i could see her face and see the kind of woman she is the kind of woman she is is soaked to the skin and major issues i mean she just tried suicide by jumping into the sky i guess she's the flotsam of this chapter we're going to get through this i promise i know i'm moving slow Hopefully another coincidence doesn't happen. <sighs> By way of reply, Carter struck a match and lit a small boy's bullseye, bullseye lantern. When the wick had caught light, 
He flashed it on the face of the woman. Her eyes were closed, but her face her face was deathly pale. Her hair was disheveled. But in the one flashing glance Hammond took at her, he recognized her. You know, it's just the the hand of the Lord at work. He's pulling all the marionette strings. <sighs> because there are no coincidences. Everything is... Is it meant to be? Or something like that. All right. He recognized her. It's Mrs. Joyce! He muttered half aloud and in amazed tones. Know her, sir? Asked the waterman. A little, he replied. Her husband is a reporter. A drinking scamp. <laughs> Speak easy, buddy. All right. Carter shut off the light of the bullseye. It's a small town, London, you know. Can't, you know, spit without getting it on somebody you know already. And we're just thinking about meeting anyway, or something like that. Or just a time to stop a sewer side. We're just here so now, sir. But uh, so it's best not to be calling tension like wit a, a light. That Carter's a smart guy. He steered the boat into a kind of narrow alleyway between two crazy old dwarves. Those wild and crazy old dwarves. There's a little bit more, but they have a bunch of asterisks running across, so I need to check something out off camera. Let's see. Uh, there's nothing. All right. Just making sure. No more coffee. This isn't getting any better, no matter what I do. Hammond, rightly gauging the kindly heart of his landlady, he brought the drenched woman in a cab to his lodgings. He was still in a half, but she was still in a half-fainted condition. When he carried her into the house, why not just drop her off with the landlady and say, hey, I'm a total gentleman. It's 1918, after all. And it's London. <sighs> In two sentences, he explained the situation to his landlady, whose natural kindness and loyalty to her lodger made her willing to aid his purpose of rescue. <sighs> I will carry her up to the bathroom, he said. Let your, uh, let your girl get a cup of milk heated as hot as can be sipped while you bathe this poor soul quickly in very hot water. And by the way, she's had a couple of drops of whiskey. I'm sorry about that. I'm expecting a letter. Ma'am. All right. Then, let her be got to bed. And have some good nourishing soup ready. She'll probably sleep after that. And in the morning... Well, the events of the morning will take their own shape. End quote. Half an hour later, as Hammond took a cup of coffee, he had the satisfaction of knowing that the woman he had saved was in bed and doing well. 
poor soul, he mused. That brute of a husband has probably driven her to this attempt on her life. I wonder what her history was before he, she married, for I remember how it struck me that day when I saw her at the office that she was evidently a woman of some culture. It was nearly ten now. He had no desire to go out again. It it wanted two hour it want wanted two hours quite to his usual bedtime. The witching hour. Uh, but a strange sense of drowsiness began to steal over him and he went off to bed. That's what happened to me last night when I was going to read this chapter in bed. I'll probably do that tonight. What a day this has been, he muttered as he laid his head on the pillow. Do you realize chapter three? And the first three chapters could have been boiled into one page. Maybe two. Well, definitely one chapter. <sighs> well, that's it for chapter three. And uh, something finally happened. Fortunately, it's staying true to course and involving coincidences. Because that's how miracles happen. Divine inspiration. I think Sidney was divinely inspired. And he said prohibition and abstinence. Have it if you want. But if it ain't your thing, you should be free to choose. Unless you're, you know, in a trap accident and uh, soaking wet. Then they can, like, force a few drops on you. Anyway, stay tuned. I don't know if this video is worth uploading, but I probably will because I'm lazy. Peace. The fuck. Out. Have a wonderful whatever the fuck it is you're having. Bye.